Hello, social workers, mental health professionals, and change agents. Welcome to another episode of the Social Work Friends Podcast. I'm your host, Bass Moreno. Thank you for tuning in wherever how you're watching or listening to this podcast. Uh, you can follow the podcast on Instagram at uh, the Social Work Rants Podcast. That's all one word. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Social Work Rants. Hit the like button on Facebook. To type in the Social Work Rants Podcast. And also hit the red subscribe button on, on YouTube. Uh, uh, appreciate everybody for tuning in, tapping in, however you're watching or listening to the podcast. I really, truly appreciate it. Saludos a todos. Um, my guess at this time, we, we've been going back and forth, trying to get, get this date down and good old fashioned patience uh, is a virtue. That's something, one of my many lessons I, I've learned doing this podcast these last two years and change. So Rosita Marinez and doing great work in New York City, um, my, my home and just a lot going on regarding housing in New York and I know I've touched on housing in New York quite a few times on, on this podcast and with our brand new mayor in place brand new governor in, in New York State in place at least well either way whether she gets re-elected or not as <laughs> either way New York is going to have another uh, the current governor who, who just took over or a brand new governor so just a lot interesting stuff, political stuff going on in New York and housing has been a big issue for a long time in New York and what better way to have someone who's in the trenches doing great work. Rosita, how you doing? I am doing fine. Thank you so much for being on your podcast. And yes, you know, as you mentioned, we've been, you know, touching base for a while and finally here. And I feel like I've been like, I don't want to say stalking, but being like, yes, I definitely want to be on social work rants because I, I really, uh, I really appreciate you opening this type of podcast because we have a voice to talk about all the great work that we do and also all the type of, you know, issues that we encounter in our daily work and having this platform to discuss about the different issues that we encounter, you know, as a society, but also how can, you know, we also, you know, implement change at a bigger level, which is in policy is a great way of starting. Um, and, you know, as Latinos or Latinx community, um, being in the social work field, which we are the minority, um, and most of our clients would tend tenants or patients are the minority that receive the services, we are their voice. And so I'm glad to be here and be able to share my experience in housing for the past 14 years in New York City. How, how do you ma maintain working in housing in New York City <laughs> for the past 14 years? Let's start there. <laughs> So that's a great question because many, many people have asked me the same thing. How do I maintain working in housing for 14 years and especially my sanity? Because housing is very complex. You know, there's different there's different moving parts in terms of housing because um you know, it's you could do direct practice of working with tenants or clients in, in terms of direct service as a, a program director, as an executive, as a de developer, you know, as in different areas. You know, the past 14 years, I've been doing a lot of management up until being a senior executive. And I have seen the different uh, complexities that it comes with. And it comes a lot with learning the population, what their need is, you know, and many times um, individuals and that fund these type of programs, they just see it as this is a pilot program. Let's see if it works. One size doesn't fit all. And so I've learned that you have to see what you know, the individual needs, you know, whether it's the mental health population, whether it's severe mental health, the substance use, you know, individuals with HIV or AIDS, seniors, domestic violence, um, veterans, I could go on in diverse populations, the youth, you need to see what is your needs um, in order to really have 
a specialized program in housing for them. Not just saying, you know, let's just build housing, place them, and then we'll work around and see if it works. Um, it doesn't work that way. Um, it, you know, the wraparound service is great to have it. You hear the current mayor saying, you know, let's house everybody. We have, you know, all these units available. We have wraparound services, but many people don't want to be in the shelter. And I'm going to give you the reasoning why. It's not the best system to be in. If anybody's been in the shelter system, it's not safe. You know, I've never worked in a shelter and I will not work in a shelter. That's my preference. And I'm going to say why. It's because when I've been in the shelter that I've been, have been on tours and seeing, and I asked many uh, people living in the shelter, they fear for their lives because, you know, they don't know who's sleeping next to them that may have a psychotic breakdown or they may want to steal their items and they rather sleep on the street feeling safe. And so is it the best model? No. Is it is it better than being in the street for other people? Yes. Um, but the thing is, when it comes to housing, I really think you have to have an open mind in terms of of a model that fits for the particular person and population that you're working with. Not only thinking, let's just house a group of people and that's it, you know? It, the work doesn't stop there. You know, the work just starts once you house somebody. Right. And I think that's where New York City or the mayors, whether it's Giuliani, Bloomberg, de Blasio, and even the current administration, and I'm not here to be political or, you know, um, saying who did what or not, is like, they're not really thinking at a bigger picture that, you know, people are human beings and that we need to think about what is your need. And instead of saying, hey, let's build all these affordable housing, are they really going to the people that really need it? And so for me, what I've seen over the 14 years is that they're not really addressing the deep rooted issues with it. That is mental health, substance use, medical and other psychosocial factors that include either family and other aspects as well. They're just seeing it as like, well, let's just house them because we don't want to see, we don't want to see anybody in the corner of, right. you know, Wall Street, you know, it's disturbing. Um, and so why not just put them in a shelter or put them in, you know, in um, one of the housing and think it's okay. They're going to go back to the street and it becomes a bigger issue. Or, you know, they, they live in supportive housing and they don't have the ADA, ADL skills to be able to live successfully. And as a providers, it becomes even more difficult to try to help individuals or chronically homeless because they've been living on the streets a certain way for many years. So my experience has been very challenging. Many times I've been like, you know, it's time to move on into something different. But what I've seen very rewarding is seeing the stages of change, you know, where someone is placed and, and, you know, having their own for the first time ever at age 40 or 50 or whatever mm -hmm. age and being so grateful and, and crying and saying thank and giving their keys and saying, thank you so much. This is my first home. I've never had my own home because they've lived on the street for so many years or just been couch surfing and having to be able to maintain and how to pay their rent and how to, you know, cook their food and take their medication or, you know, whatever it is. So for me, that's been very rewarding in terms of that aspect. It is very difficult to maintain, you know, large portfolios in terms of funding because they're always trying to cut any which way yeah, if you're not really, you know, delivering their, you know, their requirements. So um, I, it's, it's, it's challenging, but for me, it's very fulfilling to see that someone has a home. And my philosophy is that everybody deserves a home and it's a human right. No one should be on the street. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know like the, the other day I, I saw on LinkedIn that uh, the Biden administration finally came out and said the housing was is a human right like mm -hmm. and in my i was like duh <laughs> we like yeah. we, like we know that like why it took you like guys over a year mm -hmm. to finally like say that like that should have been like as part of like your can campaign and and try to do something like 
you're just now saying it okay like you already been a year going on like a year and a half in the office what have you guys done for the housing with, with the country like i know mm -hmm. uh, as president you got a million one things you know going on we still in a in a pandemic is in a yeah, situation with, with russia and ukraine and it's always like iran doing something what's china doing what's no natural disasters happen, so you, you're pulling from all different different ways. But that sh should have been talked about <laughs> as part of your your campaign. Not all of a sudden, like out the blue, it just looks ridiculous that something like even people who are not social workers are already, for the most part, kind of already know that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I want to add to that because now housing is a national crisis it's not only in new york city mm -hmm. it's california you know you have you know san francisco that there's a major housing crisis you know where there's camps you know um you have chicago you have miami um you know you have all these big cities you know that are portion of dc too portion of DC, New Jersey, I'm born and raised in New Jersey, you know, Brick City has, is going through a housing crisis, Camden, and things like that. So it is affecting uh, Seattle, also, um, is, it is affecting nationwide. And so the federal government has to address it, because it's not only New York, it's not only Los Angeles, it's affecting everybody across the board. And it's it's not only the black and brown communities, it's across the board. And so it's also like you mentioned, it's not only the under, you know, people who are, you know, living in poverty, it's anybody because of, you know, inflation, because people lose their jobs, because of mental illness, because of substance use, it could happen to anybody of becoming homeless. And, you know, um, what I'm fine, what I have found over the years is that I have met social workers like you and I with master's degrees license who have become homeless and living in supportive housing or chronically homeless because you know of mental health you know substance use mm -hmm. also attorneys and doctors so you know people have a mentality that you know oh i'll now become homeless you know like you're immune to it no it can happen to anybody and once you know you start to see that it could you know your mentality it's let me say is once you start to see people who are homeless as human beings like you and I, you start changing how you view every single aspect of it. You know, when I see someone on the street, I you don't know their story of mm -hmm. what happened to them that they became homeless. Right. And so when I started meeting former tenants or clients and started to hear this story, I was like, wow, like that could happen to anybody. And so you can't judge based on why they became homeless or what happened to them in terms of substance use or mental health and things like that, because no one's immune to it. So for me, you know, I see it as, you know, it could happen to anybody, but we need as a society, we have responsibility that you know, we all deserve a home, whether it's a tent, which, you know, now you see in New York City that they're destroying these tents. Is it allowable? I understand in terms of the zoning, but that's their home, you know, is it is it adequate? I agree to disagree to a certain extent, but is it a way to go upon it? There's, set, there's a lot to be said on how it's being handled. Some people may agree with it, some people may not. Again, it, it all has to do, how do we balance things and how do we get people's voices to advocate and, you know, people who are homeless, ask them what is best for them. Have we ever asked someone who's homeless, what do they feel is, is the best way to address the problem? I don't think they've ever asked anybody who's homeless or had a rally and address, you know, what do they feel is best for them in terms of services or a home? Or what do they need? I don't know if you've heard it. I've never heard it. No, not, not really. I mean, I might have asked doing an, an assessment like a, an assessment but in terms of like systemic like people asking those type of questions no i, I don't think i've i've heard that yeah and yeah. And, and you're right it could be any something simple as an unfortunate fire like 
you're you're homeless like it's mm -hmm. it could be you know just just anything uh lost a job just mm -hmm. a death in the family the person's like the one bringing the income and now that person passed away and we, we see it during, during the pandemic like people like lost their jobs we lost their lives from covid and it's like they're the breadwinners or they're the ones bringing the most income and mm -hmm. and now person people are like struggling to pay their rent so it's an interesting time and all these uh housing referendums ending like nationwide here in the u.s and uh, uh that's one of the questions that i asked when i started in the school system uh the, this past school year it's like hey like i know these housing referendums are, are ending uh my work at delaware and it's like oh what it what is the um the district doing like and they kind of got that that already head start like they were anticipating people being homeless like throughout the school year and trying to implement stuff in, in place which is good because not not a lot of people even like think that far ahead and just let stuff happen and then oh we should have this did this before so yeah absolutely like here like and, and in, in new york city and this is a thing that each state has different resources the federal uh, government which is the housing urban development hud they distribute funding throughout all 50 states and it's all a competition this this is this is where it goes and it gets with funding and it gets tricky it's that they all fight for the same funding and so new york city is one of the top states that receives the most funding in terms of housing compared to other other states and so there is money that that new york city receives for different levels of housing whether it's supportive housing transitional and shelters and things like that um and you know compared to new jersey i live across well not across the river but i live in new jersey and you come here to new jersey and new jersey does not have the same funding Lake New York. Absolutely none at all, if you could say. De Blasio had this whole program in terms of, hey, let's work with New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware and send people over to live one year free with that voucher. After a year, what happened? People became homeless. They were on the street of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Then the states were complaining of having people in, in Elizabeth and Camden and in Newark homeless, and they didn't want them here. And guess what happened? They started shipping them back to New York. And it became an issue here in New Jersey big time because they didn't want to see that in their backyard. And so they started shipping them back to New York and it was all over New York, uh, the news. It was a couple of years ago. I don't know if you recall that they were shipping them back to New York. And so here in New Jersey, the first supportive housing initiative was through Hackensack Medical Center back in 2019, the first one. And it was through, um, like I said, through that hospital, and it was it was a mixed housing for the doctors with low income. It wasn't even supportive housing, low income, 10 to $15 million. And so we're still behind here. So New York has a lot of resources, but like you mentioned, you know, it's either you're poor or you have the money. There's no nothing in between for the middle class, for people who work and can't afford the rent. You have staff. I have staff who are resident aides, resident counselors that have to work two to three jobs to, to be able to maintain their family and maintain the rent because if not, they'll end up homeless or even currently living in a shelter. How is that possible when you're helping people who are, who are currently living in supportive housing and then you're struggling where you're at. Makes no sense. Right. But that's the reality of what, what uh, you know, um, in terms of the housing crisis. I, re you know, another thing that, I, you know, my experience has been with the developers, and I say this because I, I went through a compliance aspect of low income housing, is that the system gives developers a lot of tax credits. Mm -hmm. I was shocked to the amount of tax credits that they give developers. The 80-20 buildings, you know, they give to low-income individuals. It's great. But if you see all the regulations of the tax credit that they get, you know, 
it's the, um, the, the millions of dollars that they save in tax credit, it's ridiculous. They shouldn't even get that amount that they get in terms of tax credit. In terms of giving low income individuals, that's nice, but they're getting more in return than what they're giving out to low income individuals. So, I'm, you know, it's great, these 80-20 buildings, but if you really see all the stipulations of all the tax credits that they're saving and, and all these perks that they give, I'm not for those type of buildings. I'm not. Yeah, and, and, they, and those type of buildings are, are just... I don't, I know back back in the day as a kid, like any like empty lot or lots that that were used mm -hmm. for for the the bootleg carnival rides, back 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 in the days are now just supporting housing like just housing units and mm -hmm. you and the, the lottery that they have in New York City for these housing is is ridiculous the, mm -hmm. the long the long waits and. And just the amount of rent they just asking for, and the income guidelines of like mm -hmm. who, like who's making this much this much yeah. money for for housing in the middle of the hood. Like I, I just mm -hmm. saw I just saw one in, in my old neighborhood, and it was like seventeen hundred for one bedroom, like literally up the street from where I used to live at. And it's like there's nothing other than like. The the joke the, the Joker movie was was filmed in in my uh -huh. in my block. Yeah, That's the, the only yeah. and Yankees and Yankee Stadium was like minutes away walking that mm -hmm. we even like consider like seventeen hundred for one bedroom like in the middle of the hood. Like I, I love where I come from, but that's absolutely ridiculous. Like and the rent the income guidelines are insane. And so, yeah, absolutely. And this is through Housing Connect and everything else. And again, you got to see who are they actually building the, these affordable units. They're not really, you know, building these affordable units for the population that is supposedly intended to be built. And again, you know, when it comes to the whole compliance piece, and I took, you know, the, this whole certification course for a week that drove me nuts because, you know, I'm a social worker. I didn't go to school for all these compliance and numbers and tax credit and everything. And I had to go through a whole process of a, a test, which I thought was like, not, not even your, for your LMSW or anything. I was like, you know what? I'm in the wrong business. If I want to make money, I might as well go into developing, being a developer with all these tax initiative, you know, incentives and all this kind of things. I was like, this is how, you know, Jeff Bezos and everybody else makes all their money. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. it's based on that. You know, is it right? I, I don't agree with it, you know. Um, that's just me, you know, but the whole thing is, again, they're not really targeting. And it's all what, what I realized after that, uh, Bass, is it all comes down to money. This is all business. Yeah, absolutely. It, they're, do, they're using the social good of what the need is for a business. Are they, are they addressing the need to a certain degree? Yes, but at the end, it's all a business, you know, and if there was not a social issue and a need there, there wouldn't be no supportive housing to a degree of a business. And I don't, you know, and I say that because over the years I realized and I worked in nonprofit, you know, all this time is, and, and I love the nonprofit world, but at the end it's like, if you don't meet your deliverables, if mm -hmm. you're not in, in the budgets and in, in that type of networking and working with developers and banks and all these other aspects and having those relationships, you really are out of the loop. You're, you're not in the game or, you know, you're not part of that housing world. And especially, oh, yeah. and especially being a female Latina where it's a male white dominant world mm -hmm. it's extremely hard and i've experienced that over the years even up until now where i am it's extremely hard to break that glass ceiling no yeah of course it's definitely been like male you know dominant for for a long time and now i now i worked at doing helping clients who were hospitalized they just institutionalized basically and they finally get their one chance 
uh, trying to get out the hospital to get them in supported housing and seeing that process and seeing their journey and helping them um, help to get their housing and maintain that. And uh, I've, you know, I've worked at Skyder State Housing with, with, with HASA in, in New York. So I've, I've seen like, the different programs and like the funding and that's, that's kind of like helped me when I look for a new job. That's like helped me be like, okay, where you guys get your funding from? Because your funding get cut, then it's my job is getting cut too somehow, yeah. some way. So, or something's going to happen in, in the job. Somebody's going to get cut. So mm-hmm. it's it's unfortunate that you know Medicaid dollars are involved, and you know though Medicaid is like the first thing that get that gets mm-hmm. cut in the but in the federal budgets, and then it trickles down to to the states and and the cities. So it's it's definitely a a, a huge need. And, and and you mentioned earlier about just the policy, like the policy need, needs to change so that stuff can actually happen and, and the changes, actual change that needs to be made. Yeah, absolutely. And, and policy comes, you know, from above and I, and, and I see, and it also comes from, you know, direct practice and, um, you know, as a social worker, I've only, you know, people want to ask me like, you know, how long have you done direct practice? Ironically for me, I've only done direct practice in my career two years. And I was at St. Vincent's Hospital back then at 12th Street in the IDC clinic uh, for two years in an initiative. Um, doing the Airbridge program, which was the first, uh, which was the f- biggest IDC clinic or HIV clinic back then. And then all I did was administration and then moved up. And the thing is that as Latinos or, you know, being part of the Latinx community, it's very hard to get into a senior leadership position because of for many reasons, we are the minority in our fields, even though the majority of the population we serve are our community. And then when you try to, when you try to establish whether it's new initiative, new programs, as you know, and, and implementing policies for our own communities or you know Black uh, African American communities as well, there there's always like a stop there. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you get all the ifs, the buts and whatever, we'll review it, we'll get back to it. We don't we don't think that might be, you know, I've gotten, oh, Rosita, maybe not now, you know, we'll review it later and I never get an answer back, but I'm very persistent and I've, you know, gotten through certain things, but it's always like a run around because I feel like at certain times of my career, People aren't ready to take that step because of a lot of things, you know, what you represent or what the change might represent for the organization. And, you know, during the pandemic, we lived through the whole George Floyd movement. And, I, mm. and that really, you know, changed a lot of things, which, you know, everybody felt it in the world. But this is, you know, the whole under, you know, and I'm going, I know I'm going on another topic, but it was the whole underlying racism of what, what this country has lived for many years, and we all have been affected, but it's part of what we do in social work, where it impacts not only housing, our staff, and everything that we do, in, and it's part of what we represent as social workers in terms of fighting for social justice and equality across the board. Yeah, absolutely. And those are just our, our core foundation of, of yeah. social work. And, and even those get get challenged within the field. And it's like, if you're challenging those core yeah. values of social work, then it might not be the the right field for you to be working at. Because, yeah. you know, something is it, it, just the nature of of the beast like you you're you're in it and that's the core values and it's something that you don't share you know personally you know those values then mm-hmm. really you really shouldn't be like in the field because you don't you're playing yourself first of all then like you're you're not you know doing the agencies you working for justice and you're not doing your clients justice like like what what are you in it for just besides the paycheck i mean that would be the only thing left for me in it for yeah, absolutely. And that's what I say when about policy. And that's why I decided to dedicate, you know, my career more in terms of not only administration and, and leadership, but changing policy, you know, in terms and, and, and 
and, and in an organization, but also establishing initiatives. Like I was part of, you know, when I was at Harlem United, part of an initiative called Positive Housing for All, which was the first MRT program for individuals who did not qualify for HASA back then. Um, you know, now they are because uh, Governor Cuomo actually, you know, passed the bill and providing the, uh, the services and permanent housing that they the level of care and permanent housing that they require through boom health and and another partnership and like you said you know the whole medicaid dollars and everything else you know and 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 also meeting the requirements so i've been part of different initiatives in, in terms of you know helping people to get permanent housing or the level of housing needed um in terms of you know, whether it's HIV or whether it's severe mental illness at Fountain House. And so it is about policy change. Um, and it is it is a battle that it's ongoing. It's not one person or two. It's a whole community where you voice, you know, as a group, you know, your concerns and, and involving, you know, your clients or tenants and, you know, staff in terms of the root of, uh, you know, fighting for justice where everybody deserves a home. I don't believe, I don't believe that people should be living in the street or in a tent, you know, um, everybody should have a home. Why here in the United States, people live on the streets. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. yeah, I agree. No, I, I, I totally, totally agree. Like, it, it's, it's really no, no, no need for that. I mean, it's it, like you said, it all goes somehow it goes back to, back to the, to money and, and you know, these developers, they're not going to care about the person living on the street. They're just trying to make their, make their money work, work for them and, mm -hmm. and service who, who they cater to, to serve. Yeah, and we're a capital, capitalist country, which I understand. But being, you know, being in the field for 14 years, you know, my gratification of being, you know, um, in different big organizations um, working in, in housing and at different levels, you know, um, it's never a dull moment, Bess. You know, it's like, I don't have, I say these are the to do things I have for today. It could be completely different, as you know, as a social worker, mm -hmm. you know, every day is something exciting and new, you know, that I, I get to meet where I am at Fountain House right now. Uh, it's members. I meet with members or, you know, I'm doing, you know, having to go to executive meetings or actually, you know, I opened up a, a housing resource center um, in February. Um, I don't know how I kept my sanity because I started October 4th and in three months, I literally opened up a whole, a whole fourth floor of a housing housing resource center and also a housing office space for um, scatter site portfolios and showcase it for the members to have a space for internal and external resources because we are in Midtown. Uh, we get a lot of um, individuals who are homeless and who are becoming members and we complete 2010s and severe mental illness with substance use and we provide those services and you know we place them internally as well as externally so these are things that are needed in the community and I and I see them every day going to work you know at the corner or anywhere in terms of the need especially with COVID you could, there's no way no one can see what's going on in New York City. There's no way. I see it every day. And so working on, the, uh, on, on what I've been working on, the Housing Resource Center and, and partnership with other organizations, um, it has increased awareness for the organization that housing is a priority, not only for the members, but expanding enrollment and also in a clubhouse modality, um, which is really not traditionally um, part of like, like BRC or the bridge to name that that's what their focus is. Uh, Fountain House is one of the only um, clubhouses in the world that has 24 hours 
residential care or, or independent housing. And now the first HRC, it's something that we want to expand throughout other clubhouses in the future. And so, you know, for me, it's, 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 for me, it's, it's dear because now I can see that, that what I've invested all these years of, of one project is now going to be more in terms of now going to hopefully down the line, uh, working at a other aspects more in policy and hopefully closely with other areas to make that change at a higher level, especially now with mental health and what's going on in New York City of Fountain House collaborating more with the current um, you know, mayor in the near future. And that's something that we're envisioning down the line. I that, that, that's great. I mean, um, as I mentioned be before, you know, pre-recording that, you know, I have some familiarity with, with Fountain House. I've had clients, a couple of clients a long time ago uh, being members of, of, of Fountain House and doing great work you know, with, with the um, mental, mentally ill and providing housing, you know, providing just you know, computer assistance, people looking for jobs and having that resource to, to go on the internet and look for work and build resume building and uh, interviewing, like prepping and just ADL skills, and just a gamut of, of different services and i'm glad to hear it continuing to, to do uh you know great work for for the community and and it's weird because you it's in midtown manhattan is right is right by times square with a ball yep. drop and it's yep. like you would n never know never know unless you like it's kind of social work in that realm of of feeling mm -hmm. never you would never know that that is there and there are quite a few social service agencies right in the middle of Times Square. You would not even know that they're you know, doing doing stuff. So there's a bunch of places down there. Yeah, it's all network there, and we have expanded to doing social enterprise. We have our own body works shop in Soho. Uh, the members do soap, hand sanitizers um shampoo i've been amazed like of like how they expanded all their services so i welcome everybody to check out www.fountainhouse.org not giving any advertising i really like love the agency in terms of how the membership is so strong and how they give tools to the members to be independent and you know regardless of having severe mental illness i have seen how members could work productively and be part of society and live independently with the supportive services in place which is awesome and maintain their housing and be able to be part of you know the advocacy in terms of mental illness um you know and kendra's law that they're advocating and other stuff that they're in agreement and disagreement and and homelessness because of the stereotype of that we see on the news that you know all the violence oh the person is mentally ill that's not the case all the time, you know? Right. So, you know, it's just being mindful about it. But in terms of the housing, you know, um, it's something that's dear to my heart. It's something that I'm committed to. And it's something that I'm gonna continue doing, you know, until, you know, who knows what my next venture is, but it will continue being housing. And I know how difficult it is and it's not for everybody, um, but it's something that I have enjoyed and will continue enjoying it. And it's now really at another level of more policy making and making that change that will impact um, in many areas. And that's really where I am. Yeah, awesome. I, I wish you guys all the success and hopefully you guys get to implement some strong policy with, with the uh, no, with the mayor, not only just the mayor, but the new uh, Manhattan Borough president that he's new to. So yeah. it's like yeah. a bunch of new politicians. So hopefully when new politicians come with new ideas and open-mindedness to stuff that of agencies like, like yourself, as you guys are already putting in the work and come with an open mind, open heart and willing to collaborate. 
Absolutely. And it, and it, and it takes a village and it's not only myself, it's mm -hmm. the rest of the executive, it's the staff, it's the members and collaborating with the, you know, our partners and everybody out there, you know, we all have a voice It all impacts us one way or the other for anybody to say, oh, that doesn't impact me. They're absolutely incorrect about it. it all impacts us you know it's not only seeing people on the streets we're all you know it could happen to anybody you know it impacts everybody we all pay tax dollars our tax dollars should be invested in in in, in housing people and getting the appropriate services and it could happen to anybody absolutely now you mentioned your ne next venture i i, I we we gonna, we gonna talk about uh uh, we have we we both got the utmost pleasure and like yes. honor to be a part of uh, Latinx and social work. The book volume two that's yes. scheduled to come out toward the end of this year, and we each got a chapter that we write. And uh, how's it going for you? <laughs> How's it going? Well, it's going. It's a little bit nerve wracking because it's Thursday and I know the, the, the you know, uh, the deadline's coming pretty soon. And so, you know, I have to do some tweaks uh, for my for me, actually. And I think I mentioned this in one of the Zooms is and, and I had a conversation with Erica is that this is something that before you know Erica officially did volume volume one 20 years ago when I was at Hunter when it was at 77th Street I've always wanted to write a book about Latinos and social work because mm -hmm. when I was at Hunter in 77th Street I was the only one in my cohort from the John Harford scholarship uh, program which was dedicated predominantly for social workers who wanted to specialize in geriatric I was the only Latina and I wanted to write my experience as being an intern as a Latina and things like that and because of life and things like that um I was never you know I didn't have a chance I I did have a chance but life goes on things right. happen and that never came to fruition. When I met Erica, and it was about, you know, on social media, and I was working on different things at Fountain House. And I said, hey, you know, we don't, we don't have a Latina board member, I would love you to come on board. And I'm, I'm working on, you know, recruiting diversity in the organization. And that's when she mentioned to me, you know, hey, I would like you to be part of the book. And I said, look, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Everybody that I meet, I said, I want to do this book. I've been writing some stuff. She's like, why don't you be part of the book? So yes, I'm a little <laughs> bit on pressure. And I know you said you love to write a lot. For me, I, I can. But, you know, I'm trying to think about what I really want to put with, with that. What, how do I say? I want to put a lot of things that are meaningful that people can connect, but I don't want to put certain things where it's not too personal. If you know what I mean with that. Yeah, yeah. And for me, and I'm just going to give a little, because I don't want to disclose a lot, because, you know, I want people to read the book and Absolutely. things like that, is that my experience being a Latina born in New Jersey in the suburbs uh, was completely different because I was the only one of Latino descent in a predominant, well, in a white neighborhood, you know, and, go, and then going to New York and living in, in New York at 18, um, and seeing people, you know, looking like me was completely different. Mm -hmm. And so when I was working in the field very young, people always used to say, you know, oh, you're Latina, you don't act Latina. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? Oh, you act white. And I was like, well, I'm looking at myself and I'm like tan. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's not the case. My, you know, I come from a mixed background, but I always have gotten that up until today. And so I imagine a lot of people who may have come from a similar background like myself or upbringing might have gotten through certain experiences like me. So that's what my focus is on, because I still get that up until today that, you know, people say you don't act Latino. So I'm always thinking, what does a Latino act like? Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, or you don't speak like a Latino. How does the Latino supposed to speak? 
And just, just to end on this is like in that aspect, when I used to smoke, I was a former smoker and I stopped six years ago. I used to smoke Parliament. And they're like, you smoke Parliament? I'm like, yeah, what's the problem with that? You don't smoke Newports. You're Latino. You're supposed to, like someone literally told me that you're supposed to smoke Newports. I'm like, like, really? I, I was just <laughs> astonished of the things I used to, and this was, I was like mind boggled of people yeah, having yeah. that stereotype that you're supposed to fit like this model, I don't even know model, like this square thing of what a Latino is supposed to be, look, or act, or talk, or your hair, or I, I don't even know what to call it, but that's really the theme of what I'm going to discuss, because I imagine many, you know, Latinas, or any many Latinos might have encountered similar experience as myself. Yeah, absolutely, it, it, it's, uh, it's great that, that you touched on that and wanted to get that out. Definitely, I could see a lot, a lot of people could, could relate to that. I, I'm looking forward to reading that chapter. <laughs> yeah, it has been a little bit antsy, a little bit of anxiety producing to me because it's bringing me back to a place like, wow, like, you know, my own community has their own judgments of my of of me you know mm -hmm. you already have a lot of pressure from the you know the, the world you know whether it's caucasian or other people you know but i've gotten more from my own community than than other groups of people which is interesting yeah i i, I could definitely see that and and Hopefully, think things will will change. I mean, uh, with new generations that are coming, and constantly things are changing in the old guard. And unfortunately, the, you know, once they're gone, they pass away. You got the I'm I'm at a point within my family. I think I'm going to be like the the old guard real, real soon. And it's yeah. like I'm only like early forties, so it's mm -hmm. like. Like, come on! I can't be the old guard yet. So, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I, I I mean, it's like I got it. I'm always like to like hand write stuff and just mm -hmm. transfer over to typing. It's like I'm too tired today to type. <laughs> I'll do it tomorrow. The tomorrow comes is like I'm like fall asleep. I'm like <laughs> fall asleep early. Then like the next day comes is like. Uh, like so that's that that's where i'm at like the deadline's coming i need to get this done oh my god that's so true because <laughs> i feel the same way but the thing is that interesting enough i did my bio i did my reflections and then i did like the first 500 words but then i need 1500 so i started backwards instead of starting with the chapters and then ending with reflection in the bio but for me those were easier to write because they were not so touchy like touchy feely personal where i have to go go into re, really self-reflection and talking about like what i'm talking now which i did speak to erica about and she's like you, you already got your chapters but as i'm talking to her and other people they're like you already have your chapters and i really haven't disclosed as much but it's just you know and i do straighten my computer and i'm like you know, just go ahead and write it and just do it. And at this point, I'm just like, it's the first draft best, you know, they're going to yeah. edit it, review it, it's a work in progress. And so I'm just going to go ahead with what I have spoken about and then, you know, get their edits and feedback and it's a work in progress. But, you know, with when it comes with things like that, it's about your feelings in your heart and how people can relate to your experiences because they're, I know there's other people going through what I've experienced and and what you know whatever you're gonna write, what your your experiences have been too. Yeah. So that's really where I am with that. But it's interesting in terms of that. But I've gotten that all my life, <laughs> and I, you know other people probably have experienced it too. Uh, that, definitely, uh, I'm 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 usually like the only Latino male in the space i'm usually like the only male in the space and mm -hmm. i know the zoom we had and i saw like two other yeah. latinos it was like i, I don't see that <laughs> hey, that's different 
Yeah, and that's the whole thing. It's <laughs> like usually males, they're this the sure males in the social work field because it's predominantly females, but especially Latino males, it's even like, you know, it's even less. But I think things are definitely changing where there's more males and you know, I'm seeing slowly, you know, more Latino males and hopefully we, you know, there are more students. Latino males getting not only their bachelor's in social work, but master's. There's so many things you could do with being a master's in social work. It's, you know, things are changing and the degree is so marketable. You could do so many things and contribute to society and your community as well. So, you know, it's not that, you know, stereotype of what it was years ago. You could do so many things nowadays. And, you know, it's great that more males and Latino males you know, go out and, you know, pursue the field and contribute. And we do need more males. So, you know, there is change that's not only a female dominant, you know, um, field. So hopefully that brings more change. And we want to hear males' voices as well in the book. So it's great that you're part of it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that actually um, was was asked to do volume one, but I had like... I just lost my job and I had to spend like the whole the whole summer <laughs> looking for work so that like I'm not there's too too much going on to to focus on focus on writing so but I'm, I'm ready for volume two even though I got a lot more stuff happening <laughs> now that I did last year so I'll make it work <laughs> yeah and you know what I always say like when you have that opportunity, there's always a lot of things going on in life. And when you have that opportunity, sometimes it only comes once in life. And when it comes, you take it and run with it. And it took 20 years. And I finally, well, you know, I could write a book anytime. But now that I have that opportunity, I might as well run with it. Because if I procrastinate for some, certain things, other things, I take it and I run with it. Um, Maybe because it's more personal to me, I'll procrastinate. When it comes to work, I'll get it done, you know, and that's it. But when it comes to things like that, I procrastinate more. So I'm excited to be part of it. I'm excited to be part of this volume two cohort. Everybody in in this book has a lot to contribute and we can all, all learn from each other and, you know, really get to contribute to you know the social work field and for and also to our own community and help others uh, you know to be you know fund the scholarship and for future social workers this is something that's i see it as something big and we leave a, a legacy for uh, you know so new social workers and in, in new generations in, in the near future yeah absolutely uh, where where could people find you where they could find me they could find me at linkedin um i'm still so other than the the other than the book i am actually going to do my own type of you know consultant a business as well and that's in a work in progress i don't want to give a lot right now because i'm still working behind the scenes i've worked in housing for 14 years and i specialize in housing with compliance and other things and i said you know rosie i work with all these big nonprofits and stuff like that why not do it for yourself and so that's something that i'm working on behind the scenes and hope to launch by the end of the year beginning of next year but you can find me in LinkedIn. Um, it's very long, but it's under Rosita L. Marinez. Um, it's I'm the only one there. It's um, and you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I am going to be opening up a business page um, through um, what is it? IG. Uh, right now, it's personal. Uh, you follow me through. R. L. Marinez, um, but I am going to be opening up my own consulting company, but it's going to be specialized in terms of compliance and housing, coaching, um, and executive leadership. I'm part of, and still diversity is still an issue, and I'm going to end with this, is that I'm part of the, uh, the Sterell Fellowship Executive Program at Hunter. I love Hunter graduated with my MSW, but I'm the only Latina in the program out of 10 for an executive uh, leadership fellowship. The only one. Mm. 
And we're in 2022 and I'm co and because of the pandemic, they had to put it on hold. And that was class of, I'm um, class of nine, uh, 2019 and 20, they had to put pause. We're restarting in the next month and I'm the only Latina still. That's crazy. And I'm the <laughs> only Latina in my organization in an executive position. Uh is that I can't believe it, but I can't believe it. it it's yeah, and then it when comes I with the territory and it comes with work. the territory and social work. And I told Erica, she's like, it seems like you've been a, a first for a lot of things. I'm, I'm the firstborn. I'm the only female, and I've been a lot of a first in social work. But being in 2022, when I was part of that cohort, and I'm looking around, I'm, I'm saying, wait a minute. Am I, am I seeing things? I'm the only Latina. Absolutely. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Rosita L. Marinez. I'm the only one there. It's a very unique name. If I tell you the whole LinkedIn, it's because of all my credentials. You can find me there. Um, you can see my bio and my work and the different initiatives. I was part of the single stop modality with Robinhood and Seco, the first one that launched in, back in 2005, the Workforce One and other initiatives. Um, and once, you know, I, that's why I said about ventures, um, other than the Latinx volume two, I am going to be doing consultant work by the end of the year and crossing my fingers 2023. So you'll hear more about me. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. And I greatly appreciate, you know, in terms of that, we didn't rant so much just because when I say rant, I'm thinking about like, <laughs> long, but I kind of did in a way. <laughs> Man, but I really we, appreciate we can, you we can, we can to rant. Travel. We could, if we wanted to, we could really rant about all, yeah, all the I BS know. with housing in New York City going on with, yeah, with, with all the mayors, with all the mayors, and more than, and and and, 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 and the borough and presidents lot, too, and the borough per, and and more than that, you know, yeah. and, and, and more than that too, because other than housing, I actually did HIV work for a long time. That's actually my specialty. Okay. I specialize in HIV and AIDS mental health and substance use prior to getting into housing. I got into housing by default, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I specialized in HIV, uh, mental health and housing. Um, and so I worked at St. Vincent's Hospital, which is no longer there on 12th Street. Um, I was an IDC social worker uh, for two years. Uh, they had a immigrant immigrant program, the first immigrant program and Airbridge program. The Airbridge program was designed for individuals who are HIV positive traveling from Puerto Rico to New York to get access to care. Mm -hmm. St. Vincent's no longer there. They went out of business and now the develop, it's a, a whole luxury complex and immigrant, yeah, the immigrant program was designed for immigrants who are HIV positive. And instead of using the emergency room, they qualify for ADAP. And I actually got hired there because I did my field placement at Hunter and they offered me a job there. So I was there for two years. And then moving forward, um, I was offered a manager position at Mount Sinai for their prenatal HIV program through their HRSA grant. Mm -hmm. So I was there for a year. And then from there, I did workforce development through the Robin Hood Initiative, SECO, when they launched the single stop model in the workforce development up in Harlem um, through the Workforce One, which was with the Department of Labor. And they closed that site because they relocated. So I was the program manager to roll out the single stop model in uh, a workforce one. And then I was the director of programs for an international agency called Aid for AIDS. And they did um, HIV advocacy peer, uh, you know, they did peer work, uh, but especially recycle HIV meds. So if someone went on to a different cocktails and stare, instead of throwing them out, they recycle them and they ship them to Mexico, uh, Dominican Republic, um, Venezuela, Peru, and Colombia. And so I traveled to different countries. Um, and also I started their Miami office as well. So I did that for two years and a half and traveled a lot. So that's really how I started my career, which was HIV and AIDS. I went into housing, um, and then at Housing Works, I was the clinical supervisor in their uh, ADL center. What is it? The adult care center around 14th Street before they closed. I was there. And then I got into housing. I won't say by default. It was a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And so that's how I started housing, but it really was HIV, AIDS, and mental health and substance use. So yeah. that's, that's in, a, in, in a nutshell, really. Yeah, that, that, that if I could find a, a, a HIV agency that really, I feel like there's so many good agencies, but it's all about the funding and their pay to case managers and social workers mm -hmm. and is not adequate to all the work that comes with it because this is a lot mm -hmm. of work and it's like oh, I would love to go back into into that field but just the mm -hmm. money is not right at all yeah it's not and then the thing is that because HIV it is a chronic illness but people don't die of HIV no more like they used to mm. people will die of a heart attack or high blood pressure or cancer um it, the funding is no longer there Ryan White funded has decreases decreased uh tremendously over the years and so yeah I totally get it understand that I got funded and was director of programs for an inch the A for AIDS which is an international organization was the Robin Hood an initiative in order to roll out um, uh, an initiative of getting immigrants to get tested through the consulates, um, to get enrolled through health insurance, um, also through legal service, helping helping them get asylum and all these other services. And it was through Robin Hood. That's how it got funded. That's how I got paid. And they still have that program, and the and the program in Miami that we that that I initiated there, um, they the don't uh, the one of the board members gave us the space. But the thing is that in Florida, Miami, they don't have the same funding. But and so the program only lasted about a year and a half, and then it was out of our control because we didn't have the money to sustain it because the funding down there is completely different. We try to partner with Jackson. What is it? Jackson Memorial Hospital. And that didn't last long. Mm. So that's, that's, you're right. That's what it comes down to. But the, the program in New York is still existing. Um, the recycling program still exists in, in uh, Mexico and the other countries and the office in New York. The one that does not exist is in Miami because the funding is completely different. Gotcha. So yeah, that's really in a nutshell. <laughs> It's a lot, but yeah. yeah. It was good to it was good to see you again, and definitely good to talk Thank to you. Thank you. Thank we'll you. Definitely so much be talking soon. Yes. With with our uh, chapters coming soon. <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, after this, and I am going to have dinner and going to start writing away. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you to it. Take care. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. Take care. Okay. Bye.